Getting ready to buy or sell a home in 30, 60, or 90 days? Then check out BundleSelect.com to find out how you could save 20% or more on your entire transaction. Save on real estate, lending, and title. With BundleSelect.com, technology and a personal concierge are at your service to save you time and money. Bundle Select's hand-picked team of experts will compete for your business, so you'll save thousands of dollars by bundling all of these services. BundleSelect.com gives you all the control, including using your own realtor. I'm Joe Kuchera with Real Estate Radio Live, and I have been on the radio educating consumers for years. By bundling services like real estate, lending, and title, you could save tens of thousands of dollars. Act now, and this new model could save you money on your move, lower your interest rate, or cover your closing costs. Visit BundleSelect.com. That's BundleSelect.com. The estimated minimum savings are based on a comparison with the national average. Individual results may vary, and the estimated savings are not guaranteed. Bundle Select Inc. is a licensed real estate broker. California Bureau of Real Estate Broker. License number 0046902. Welcome to Real Estate Radio Live an informative and engaging podcast discussing everything you need to know about the world of real estate. Your host, Joe Kachera, provides you with insight and guidance on how to buy, sell, finance, and invest in real estate. He also offers real estate tax management strategies, new construction advice, home improvement tips, and much, much more. And now, to guide you around the world of real estate, Here's your host and Real Estate Radio Live team leader, Joe Kachera. Welcome in. Joe Kachera with Real Estate Radio Live. Thank you again for those that are following us on Facebook. Uh, continue to give us some feedback, response. We want to continue to grow the audience. And really the goal here is to have as many people as possible watch the show, view the show when we're doing the live feeds on Facebook, but then just as importantly, be sure to download the podcast. You could do that uh, by going to iTunes and just typing in Real Estate Radio Live. You could go to our website, reradiolive.com, and you get download the podcast there. And we want to continue to grow the show. It is growing at rapid rates. And the exciting part about that is the more information we get out to more people, the goal and objective has always been the same. You'll hear me say this a lot for those who have been following the show. And my goal an objective has always been, since I've started this show almost eight years ago, has been to get as much information and education out there to the you, the consumer, so you can make wise decisions or have a better chance of making wise decisions in and around your real estate, whether you're buying, selling, financing, construction, um, you need architect work, legal work, tax work, financing, uh, financial planning, anything around real estate, we want to help you do that. So we'll continue to do that, before I jump into the topic today, just a reminder, if you need to reach me during the week, 408-838-9060, you can always email joe at reradiolive.com, and um, for more information, you can always go to the website, reradiolive.com. I want to continue to remind everybody, too, that we have a great network, and I want to, sometimes I forget to remind our listeners that... If you need realtors, financial planners, CPAs, legal advice, anything to do with real estate, we have those on our website, reradiolive.com. We have vetted professionals. We have a great network of people that can help you in all those areas. So if you need help in those areas, we're happy to do that for sure. All right, let's jump on the topic today. For the first segment, we have two things I want to talk about today. The first segment, I'm going to talk a little bit about financing when you're retired and financing for those that don't have traditional jobs, or maybe you're not working. I know that sounds strange, but a lot of people I find still that are retired think for some reason they can't get financing, residential financing or commercial, whatever it is. I also find that some people that don't have traditional jobs, maybe not a traditional W-2 income earner, also struggle. Sometimes they're not quite sure if they're available to get financing. I just want to keep clearing this. This comes up a lot. Still, and I think because there's misperception, there's people who listen to certain media outlets, you'll read information that would suggest that just because one retires or if you don't have a traditional job, you can't get financing. That's not right. That's not correct. There's financing out there available for many different people that do not have, that's right, that do not have traditional W-2 income. So I'm going to go through that, talk a little bit of that on the first segment. The second segment I'm going to talk about, speaking of financing, stated income is coming back. It's called, in these days, you might hear non-QM qualified mortgage is the kind of the trigger word that you're hearing a lot. And really what that means is it's getting closer and closer to stated income programs that are coming back out. 
I don't think it surprises most of us in this industry that a lot of these stated income programs will come back out or you start seeing more and more of them now for a couple different reasons. Number one, the amount of financing that lenders are doing today are down. The reason why is the refinance market for all intents and purposes is not over, but it's very limited. So the refinance business out there right now is what I call situational refinance. There's still people that need to refinance to consolidate debt, to consolidate a first and second, to maybe get a construction loan, remodel, add-on. So there's still refinancing available, but there were companies that were born and grown to record paces because of the refinance market over the last decade. And that's pretty much over. So you've heard me say this before. There's going to be a lot of consolidation in this industry, the lending industry, a lot. You're going to see some mergers, buyouts. I think keep an eye out for 2018 and 2019. Sometime between now and 2020, I really do think there's going to be a lot more consolidation in the lending and residential financing business. I really do because there's not enough business to go around for all the players that are out there. And there is some lenders like Quicken Loans, Cash Call, and some of these others that were built. They built the very existence of these companies were built on the refinance market. And so now the refinance market's going away, and now they're looking around trying to figure out where do I get the business? Where do I get the purchase business? How do I recover that volume that we had for years? So this is the reason why we're going to start seeing more stated income and financing becoming available, and we're going to see people because they need more volume. These lenders need to satisfy the more volume and bringing more loans in. The way you do that is you come out with new programs that really what you do is you come out with more programs that allow more people to qualify, if that makes sense. So you you look at the credit scores, you look at the ability to qualify, you look at kind of traditional stuff that we do, and they're stretching those and they're expanding those. They call them expanded programs, and you'll see more and more of those. So I'll get into more specific detail in the second segment. So let's talk first. I'm going to talk first about financing for those that are retired. So if you're listening to this podcast, you're watching us, please understand that first and foremost, just don't listen to the people that tell you you can't get financing if you're retired or if you don't have a traditional job. It's not true. When I say it's not true, you still have to make income a certain way. But income is income. This is what a lot of people don't understand. And some people even in my business get confused by that. If you make income from a W-2 employer, if someone's paying you as a W-2 income, that income is no different than pension income, retirement income, social security income, investment income. My point is all of these things fall under the umbrella of income. And it is, as long as it's steady and you have the ability to continue earning that income, that's the key then it is treated as income and you could qualify. So let's talk first a little bit about the person that's retired. Okay, so let's say a person's retired and for just sake of a conversation, maybe in retirement they're making $5,000 a year in their pension and then maybe they get another $2,500 a month in their retirement. And so right now they're grossing about $7,500 a month and that's money, that is income that they receive every single month. That is no different than a person that's working for Apple or Google or anybody else or Safeway or Walmart. No different than that person making $7,500 a month. No different. So you look at that income the same. The people that are retired, as long as you have some kind of income that you show, we could use that income to qualify you for financing on a refinance or a purchase. So don't let anybody tell you any different. Now, You do have to work with someone that understands that. Most people in our industry should understand it, but some don't. I'm happy to help you. Remember, that's my primary job, my business. I help people with financing. I help people with financing. If you're looking for financing on a refinance, a purchase, I could help you with that. Now, again, on those that are retired, we'll go through kind of the different typical non-traditional incomes. Pension, retirement, Social Security, Sometimes people get military income pensions, a lot of those types of things. Now, some people, I just did a loan for a client that they get disability income, permanent disability. I just did a loan for a couple. One of the family members got permanent disability. 
And that, regardless of the amount, they get that for the rest of their life. So you count that as income. That is calculated with income. So these are the types of things that you could use to qualify if you're trying to finance. When you're retired, and I'm going to go into, after I talk about the retired personnel, then I'll go into someone that's maybe not retired because there is a difference. Now, keep in mind, retired means a couple different things. I just want to clarify this. So typically in the world, kind of in the world of financing and our business, if you are 59 and a half or older, then you could use qualified assets, IRAs, those types of things for distribution income too. That's another thing. So let's say you're 65 years old and you make between your pension and your Social Security, you make $7,500 a month. And let's say you need roughly $9,000 a month. You need another $1,500 a month to qualify for this home that you want to purchase. Let's say you have investable assets. Okay, this is over and above. So you have, let's say you have a couple million dollars in invested assets that have nothing to do with the pension that you have coming in from your retirement and your Social Security. We could look at those qualified assets if you're 59 and a half or older, and we could take those qualified assets and we could convert and use them as income. We do it all the time. Let's say we need an additional $1,500 a month. We go to the financial planner or the institution that, that holds the money, that manages the money for that client, and we get a letter from that institution on behalf of the client that reads, starting this month, the client's going to receive $1,500 a month going forward from this account, from this qualified account coming to this statement and this account each month. It's that simple. And as long as you have enough assets to do that, typically it's a three to five year period of time is all the minimum we're looking for, then we could use those assets and convert them to income. So these are some of the things that we do all the time for people that are retired. Let's talk about now someone that is not retired, but they don't have a traditional job. And again, this happens in Silicon Valley. It happens from time to time. I've seen people that decide to take some time off and they're still younger in their 40s and 50s, but they're deciding to take a few years off. And all of a sudden they decide, well, gosh, I'd like to finance a home. And they'll come to me and I'll look at their income and they say, well, gee, you know, I haven't worked I took some time off. I made quite a bit of money in some stock options, so we decided to take a couple of years off, and that's what we're doing. All of a sudden, now we want to buy this house. Well, there's a way to help them, too, depending on the assets they have. So there's another program to get income that's called asset depletion. And what you do for a person that is a little bit different, that's not of retirement age, you look at their assets and find out whatever their assets are. There's a formulation that we use We could give them monthly income based on the assets they have. So if they have several million dollars a year, there's a chance that we could give them some income ongoing for a while and allow them to qualify to get a loan. Now, it depends the size of loan. It depends on how many assets, how much assets you have to be able to get that done. You still have to have the ability to make income, if that makes sense. That probably really makes more sense than anything else. Try not to get hung up on the fact that you have to have a traditional job because that is not correct. You do have to have the ability to make income in some form, in some way, whether that's traditional job, pension, Social Security, investments, partnerships. Here's another thing we see all the time. Someone's retired or they have very little income, but traditional income, but then we look at their portfolio and they have five or six rental properties that are owned free and clear, and they're collecting ten dollars to $12,000 a month in rental income. That is income. Someone that has real estate, whether it be commercial or residential, and that's verifiable, and we look at that, we see that income, we know that it's going to continue. They still own those properties. They have a track record. We look at the tax returns. They have a track record of collecting that rent. That is rental income. That is income. You could use that to qualify. There are so many different ways to qualify. And I wanted, I do these shows every once in a while specifically. I probably do shows like this every, I don't know, two or three times a year because I still think that most people, unfortunately, don't get this information. They don't get it correctly, and I think they're misled. And that's why I do these shows from time to time to educate you and remind you that there are opportunities out there for the people that are retired and don't have a traditional job to get income. 
So those are some different ways for people that are not retirement age, but they also want the ability to get income. Now there's also trusts. There's partnerships. I've seen before people that have trust income. So they were fortunate enough or something happened. Maybe it wasn't so fortunate. Maybe whatever reason they have assets that were wheeled to them or trust income. I've seen that before. Someone's getting eight to $10,000 a month every single month from a trust, from a family trust or from an investment trust or something like that. I've seen that before. Commercial partnerships. I've seen situations where people are involved partnerships where they have a piece of equity in this conglomerate or this partnership. And because of that, that partnership pays them a certain amount of money each month. Dividend income or investment income pays that every single month. So if there's a track record for this, if there's a track record that someone has to do that, then this is very doable. All right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a quick break. I'm going to come back, and I'm going to talk more specifically. I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about stated income programs, more liberal income, I should say financing, I should say more liberal financing that's coming into the marketplace more and more. I'll discuss the reason why that's happening and what kind of programs you could expect. This is Joe Kuchera with Real Estate Radio Live. I'm going to take a quick break. I'll be back to continue in just a minute. Thanks. For more information on today's program, visit reradiolive.com. That's reradiolive.com. Getting ready to buy or sell a home in 30, 60, or 90 days? Then check out BundleSelect.com to find out how you could save 20% or more on your entire transaction. Save on real estate, lending, and title. With BundleSelect.com, technology and a personal concierge are at your service to save you time and money. Bundle Select's hand-picked team of experts will compete for your business, so you'll save thousands of dollars by bundling all of these services. BundleSelect.com gives you all the control, including using your own realtor. I'm Joe Kuchera with Real Estate Radio Live, and I have been on the radio educating consumers for years. By bundling services like real estate, lending, and title, you could save tens of thousands of dollars. Act now, and this new model could save you money on your move, lower your interest rate, or cover your closing costs. Visit BundleSelect.com. That's BundleSelect.com. The estimated minimum savings are based on a comparison with the national average. Individual results may vary, and the estimated savings are not guaranteed. Bundle Select Inc. is a licensed real estate broker. California Bureau of Real Estate Broker. License number 0046-6902. Welcome back to Real Estate Radio Live. For more information on today's topic or guests, just visit reradiolive.com. That's reradiolive.com. Again, your host for today's edition of Real Estate Radio Live, Joe Kuchera. Welcome back in. Joe Kuchera with Real Estate Radio Live. Thank you for those that are following us via Facebook. We're streaming live every single show. Just a reminder, what we try to do is stay on schedule Unless I'm out of town or something's going on, we try to stay to a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday show on a podcast. We try to do it right around 3.05 to keep consistent so we have the listenership, the following ship in a certain way. So again, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday is our regular schedule in case something happens. doesn't always stay the same. Every once in a while we'll do Fridays with Jack Russo depending on his schedule. Those are fun shows with Jack. We do something, uh, starting something new in Silicon Valley. Jack is the managing partner of the Computer Law Group in Palo Alto, and he has uh, three to almost four decades of legal background in terms of entrepreneur, helping entrepreneurs start companies, intellectual property, business practice, litigation. His firm does a lot. If you want more information about Jack's firm, you could go to computerlaw.com. That's computerlaw.com, and he's on our website, too, at reradiolive.com. All right, so let's talk in the second segment about the stated income programs that are coming back. Some of you remember from the back in the heyday when the mortgage meltdown took place, a lot of people will go look back and blame and make excuses and blame the mortgage industry, which is a whole new topic of conversation. They'll blame the mortgage industry for them. They call it the mortgage meltdown. Well, there's a lot of factors that went into that, and I don't want to go too sideways here, but for those that don't remember, back in you know 08, 09, I think 7, 8, 9, right in that time frame, over the years leading up to that time period, 2007, I think is when it kind of peaked, there was financing taking place with people that never should have got financing. 
Thank God that I was in a market where we always did what we call a paper. We did have stated income programs, but we never, I never, my personally and my companies never did subprime lending. We never funded or invested in the called no doc, no income, no doc, no nothing. There was a lot of those programs out there where you really didn't have to, you didn't even have to really put fog on a mirror. There was people getting financing that never should have got financing. Most of us know that. So that was part of the cause with the big run-up in real estate. Everybody was buying, you know, the economy was frothy, all kinds of wonderful things that were going on. And it came to a collapse because when real estate prices start dropping, guess what? When you had people buying, having people get 100% financing, you went out and you could get 100% financing on a million-dollar home. This is how crazy it is. And you didn't even have to qualify for that home. Think about how that recipe for disaster was coming. Most of us didn't see it because we thought the real estate was going to keep going. We thought the economy was going to keep going. We didn't know anything about those. In the meantime, there was a lot of problems in the background, and you could find out, you could really realize what was taking place. And again, thank God that we never got involved with that kind of financing, but it did affect the entire mortgage industry in a big way. So you know you could imagine why people were walking away from homes and just abandoning them to a certain extent, and there was foreclosures left and right because you had these people that had no skin in the game. They would finance a home 100% financing. They couldn't qualify. They'd get the place. Think about it. You buy a home for a million dollars. You have no down payment. You have no skin in the game. There's no investment on your part other than you qualified for the loan at the time, which you shouldn't have. A year later, because of the meltdown, that million-dollar home that you bought with nothing down is now worth $600,000. Think about that. Think about what those people were feeling like. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but imagine putting yourself in their shoes. Think about what a person feels like when they paid a million dollars for a house, they put no down payment, and now all of a sudden that home is worth 600000 What do you think the likelihood or what do you think the percentage would be that you'd be betting that when things got tough that they would walk away from that house? Of course they would. I'm not condoning it. I don't think people should, but they did. Because they thought, well, wait a minute. This house is worth six hundred grand. I paid a million for it. It'll never come back. I'm out of here. And they would walk away from it. That was happening all over the place, all over the nation, left and right. And there was many things that were taking place. We had the government bail out, bailed out the lenders, and uh, big mess. So the reason I want to just quickly go through that for those that probably remember, or maybe those that don't remember, is that There's all kinds of new changes to lending and financing after that came out. And, you know, they did away with these no income, no asset loans, and you didn't have to have a job to get a loan. It was crazy. Did away with those. Went back to the super conservative financing. Some people would say that financing is still very conservative, but it is by nature. That's true. So now what we have is because the market is slowing, the refinance market is dried up, these lenders and investors are looking around and thinking, how do we get more business? How do we get more business? Well, guess what? One of those solutions, one of the ideas is to bring back more liberal, more expanded programs that bring more people into the market, that allow more people to qualify other than someone that has good credit, traditional job, and traditional down payment. So stated income loans are kind of like this, and I'll, I'll describe them kind of the way they work. What happens is there's different names for them. A lot of times you'll hear instead of stated, now you'll hear a non-QM. That means non-qualified mortgage. That means it's not backed or regulated by Fannie, Freddie, and the U.S. government. So these are private investors that are offering this money. So what happens is they have these expanded guidelines. So they'll say, yeah, absolutely, we'll finance Mr. and Mrs. Smith. But here are our liberal guidelines. Instead of a minimum credit score at 680, We'll go down to 620. So we'll allow you to do your financing, and all you need to have a 620 or better score. We'll do it at 5 or 10% down. Yep. We'll do it stated income. So show us some bank statements, and even if you don't have a traditional job and maybe your business loses money, but let's take a look at those bank statements. So if you have 12 months of bank statements that show us that you have some consistent amount of money coming in, but yet we realize that because you're a business owner, you take advantage of some of those tax benefits, but we still could see the cash flow each month, we're going to make a loan for you. However, 
because it's a more risky loan, because it's a non-qualified mortgage, because it is a, a stated type loan with expanded guidelines, you're going to pay a premium. So what happens on loans like this is you get someone that can't qualify. I'll give you another example. Traditional underwriting, I don't want to get too technical here or lose anybody, but if any of you, you guys hear DTI, debt to income ratio, traditional lending says that we do not like to see your debt to income ratio go over 43 to 45% is about the max. Jumbo's 43, is typically conforming's 45, it could be higher. They don't typically like to see your total debt to income gross go over 45% of your income. So some of these stated income programs or, or the expanded non-QM programs will say, I'll tell you what, we'll go to 49%, we'll even go to 50 or 51% if we like to file. The reason they could do that is because they make the rules. These are investors that don't follow the Fannie Freddie guidelines. They're not regulated, so they make the rules. So the reason they do that is because they have expanded programs allow more people to finance. See, if you didn't have programs like this, you might have millions of people that can't buy a home or refinance a home. So that brings in a whole new set of clientele and more consumers that could buy a home or refinance or get financing. You pay a premium for it, however. Let's just say, for instance, the going rate on a 30-year fix today is 4.5%. You know, if it's traditional income and credit and assets and all that. Let's just say, for example, today the 30-year fix is 4.5%, standard 45 at standard closing costs. And you now have one of these expanded programs that are non-QM and stated income loans, and you have a person that can't qualify for that 4.5% 30-year conforming Fannie Freddie loan. So they go to a non-traditional financing, and they look at that, and they look at their paperwork, they underwrite the file, and they say, sure, we can do this for you. The difference is, is it's a more risky loan. And because of that, instead of 4.5%, we're going to charge you 5.5%. And it's not a 30-year fix. It's a 5-1 arm. It's fixed for five years. The reason why these programs are designed to short term is because the idea is that you want to later, eventually, when you get more income or you get a job or you improve your credit or whatever it is, you could get out of that higher rate program into a more conventional mortgage. So you're not going to see a 30-year fixed with a lot of these non-QM and stated program loans. These are also known as temporary short-term loans to get you to the next stage. So you're going to find that they're about 1% or more on the interest rates. About 1% or more you will find that these QM, non-QM loans, I should say, for financing. And you might even have to pay a point. It depends. Your fees could be higher. You could have a prepayment penalty. Some, most of them don't these days. I think if it's governed the correct way and it's offered the right way, I do think I like the idea of these loans. I do. Because it does allow people that are self-employed, maybe ran into a little bit of trouble. They don't have, you know, maybe the, the credit's not as good as it should. Maybe they don't have quite the down payment. Maybe they don't have quite the income, but they do have some good cash flow. It allows these people to do some financing. And I think that's good, as long as it doesn't go too far. Where I think it goes too far is when they start offering, I hope they don't do it again, is the no income qualifiers, no income, no assets, no credit, all that. I think that's, if we ever get there again, I, that would make me nervous, and I don't think anybody wants to go back there again. So again, just to summarize before I wrap up today, this, you'll see it more and more. You'll hear it stated incomes coming back. Non-QM means non-qualified mortgages. I think if it's offered properly and it's managed properly and you have credible investors that are offering these programs. I think it's great because it allows more people to finance. All right, we're going to wrap things up for today. Thanks again for checking in. This is Joe Cachero with Real Estate Radio Live. Thank you for those that are following us on uh, Facebook, streaming live. Continue to do that. Again, for more information, you can always go to reradiolive.com. That's reradiolive.com. Thanks again for tuning in today. Take care. You've been listening to Real Estate Radio Live. For more information on today's program, visit reradiolive.com. That's reradiolive.com. Subscribe to our podcast. Discover more at reradiolive.com.